Studies have shown that we are hardwired for story and that uh, when confronted with facts that contradict the story that our hearts have wrapped around and embraced, no amount of facts can get us to release that story. It's actually only a more compelling story that can get us to let it go and transform. Our next presenters bring mystery, music, myth, and magic. And I really don't know how to anticipate what they might co-create together. I just know that when two of the most extraordinary, gifted, and visionary social change communicators on the planet ask us if they can jam together, their correct response is, well, absolutely, yes. And as high a calling as storytelling is, to describe Michael Mead as a storyteller doesn't quite do justice to the depth of knowledge, the oratory, the luminous symbolism, and the committed street smarts that Michael brings to his art. This scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology is renowned, among many other things, for his spellbinding interpretations of ancient myths and his commitment to an equitable and sacred and whole world. Michael is the author of many books, including Fate and Destiny, The Two Agreements of the Soul, and The World Behind the World. And I was thinking backstage about how when I feel lost, um, it's Michael's CDs and Michael's books that I often turn to. He is the founder of the Extraordinary Mosaic Multicultural Foundation, which is a Seattle-based nonprofit dedicated to education and cultural healing. Michael has taken storytelling, perhaps the oldest human performance art, into new dimensions of transformative power. His remarkable gift lies in tapping into humanity's deep ancestral sources of wisdom and animating them by connecting them to the challenges and struggles that we face today. But of course, this is a duet, and jamming with Michael will be just as extraordinary a communicator. John Densmore is renowned as a founding member and the drummer of one of the most influential and beloved rock bands of all times, The Doors. <laughs> yeah. And percussion, of course, is a language older than words, one that captures the essence of human and animal heartbeats and of nature's ancient and secret coded languages. Unlike some rock drummers, John is actually a highly literate, sophisticated fellow, an accomplished author, an award-winning documentary filmmaker, and a longtime passionate human rights and ecology activist. He has taken courageous stands in recent years against the commercialization of music, and John has long been a great ally and friend. So it's with great anticipation and not a little curiosity that I invite to the stage two legendary, masterful, and multidimensional communicators, Michael Mead and John Densmore. Thank you. Hey, John. Thank you, Nina. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Um, what we're going to do mostly is tell a story, drum a little bit. Um, it's what you call a multicultural presentation. I'm going to play a West African djembe, but I think I'll start with an East African rhythm. Uh, the original skin on the drum didn't make it all the way across the water, so it now has a Vashon goat skin on it uh, from up near Seattle. I'm going to tell it the story with the New York accent and give you an Irish interpretation in the middle. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I would like to thank Nina for diffusing the dumb drummer jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I checked into the embassy hotel suites, they gave me my plastic room key in a little packet. And on the front of it, it said, open doors. <laughs> we ready, John? We ready for a story?
You know, they say in the beginning was the word, but in Africa they say in the beginning was the sound. In tribal places all over the world, they say in the beginning was the sound. And the sound that began at the beginning reverberates even until this day. For the sound is what is inside each person, not only the heartbeat, but the unique vibration that makes a person exist in this world. And everything in this world is vibrating with sound. And it's a sound that started at the beginning and it continues now. And some people say that creation was back there, but the ancient people say creation is right now. And we are in the midst of it. And we are being invited to be agents of the ongoing creation. At least that's what they say when they're in the old world, when they're in the earth-related places. And there they also tell stories. And they say, in the beginning when the word and the sound came in, knowledge also came into this world. And they say that knowledge hides in places all throughout this world. As a matter of fact, the native people here in North America, many of the tribes tell a story about how knowledge is hiding in a particular cave. And if you could find your way to that cave, you would find exactly the knowledge that you're looking for. But a strange thing, that although that cave exists, and although there are roads going in all directions, super highways, all kinds of two tracks, back roads, side roads, off ramps, despite all that, no one seems to find that cave. And yet, if you found that cave, you could find the exact knowledge you need in order to survive this world that seems to be falling apart moment to moment. And inside that cave, there's an old woman. And that old woman has been weaving a garment for a very long time. She's been weaving the most beautiful garment that anyone has ever seen. And she's just reached the point where she's trying to finish the hem of the beautiful garment. And she wants that hem to be as beautiful as possible. And so she's making the hem out of porcupine quill. And in order to make the hem, she has to bite down on the porcupine quill. She likes the idea of taking something that could stick you and turning it into something that's beautiful. And so she bites down on those quills and she's been biting down on quills for such a long time that her teeth have been worn down to nothing but nubs rising above the gums. But still, she keeps weaving and she keeps biting down and she keeps making the garment that is the most beautiful thing that anyone has ever seen. And every once in a while, she has to stop and go to the back of the cave. And in the back of the cave, there's a fire burning. And hanging over the fire, there's a cauldron. And they say that fire is the oldest thing in this world, that it's been burning since the very beginning of time. When the word and sound came into the world, the fire was already there. And they say that in that cauldron, there is a stew of seeds and grains that are the source of all the fruits and all the foods on the earth. And if the old woman doesn't go back once in a while and stir that cauldron, then all the seeds will burn. And if the seeds burn, there won't be any grains to eat, and there won't be any fruits, and there won't be any vegetables, and there won't be any flowers. And so the old woman puts down her weaving, and she walks to the back of the cave, and she walks slowly because she's been weaving for so long, and she's tired. And apparently she needs a new mic. Can you hear me now? Did you hear what I already said? All right. And so the old woman has to put down the beautiful garment. She lays it on the floor of the cave, and she goes slowly to the back of the cave and begins to stir the stew of seeds that's being heated by the fire that's the oldest thing in the world. And while she's doing that, the black dog, what black dog? The black dog goes over to all the weaving that's laying on the ground and seeing a loose thread 
the black dog, and don't blame it on me. Seeing a loose thread, the black dog picks up the thread and begins to pull. And soon enough, the black dog has unraveled all the beautiful weaving that the old woman has been doing for oh so long. The black dog unravels the whole thing. And the old woman stirs the soup at the back of the cave until she's ready to come back. And when she comes back, what she sees is all of her beautiful weaving unraveled in chaos on the floor. And at that point, she stops. And maybe she meditates to consider what's happening. And while she's meditating, she's looking at the mess and the chaos that now covers the floor. And you could say we are in that moment of time. We ourselves are standing before the unraveling of culture and the rattling of nature in that Kairos moment that is not one thing or the other. When all that has been made seems to be falling apart. Do you know what I'm talking about? For whatever reason, we have decided to come to this earth and live at the time when both nature and culture are unraveling a bit. And maybe there's something we need to understand about the cave of knowledge and what can be learned in there. Because something happens after the old woman contemplates the collapse of everything that she has made. She herself picks up a loose thread and she begins to weave. And she begins to weave, and as she weaves, it comes into her a vision that is even more beautiful than the vision she had before when she first wove the most beautiful thing that anyone had ever seen. She begins to weave and weave and follow this vision that she has, and there she is again, weaving the entire world back together because the old woman is the wise old woman of this world that is weaving things from the beginning to the end and from the end back again, entering the beginning and starting all over because in terms of mythology, this world cannot end. This world did not begin one day. This world began in eternity. And when eternity cracked and split open space, it poured this world out. And the old woman began weaving. And she is weaving again or getting ready to do so. And you could say the issue for those of us who have come to a place like this, who are considering how to make things connected and whole again, the issue is are we each going to pick up a thread and begin to join the reweaving of the world? Or or are we not? Because human beings are actually, human beings when they choose to be, are actually the co-creators of the world, on a good day at least. And human beings are actually the agents of imagination, the making of the world moment to moment, again and again. At least that's what the old people say when they tell stories and they tell this story when the world is in the most trouble. And me, I'm sticking with the old stories. I'm sticking with the very old stories because they always reach the end and start over again. Thank you. So you get the idea how stories work. In ancient Greece, they said, there's two major ways of thinking, logos and mythos. Logos is factual, rational, and it tends to be linear, trying to go from one place to the other and collect and elucidate facts along the way. Mythos is something else altogether. People think nowadays that myth means something false, but the old meaning of myth is emergent truth. A myth is a series of lies that tells the truth. The facts all put together can never amount to the truth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the facts are important, logos is important, 
Rationalism is important, but that is only seeing one half of the world, and the other half of the world is seen from the eye of the soul, and that's the world of misos, which knows through emotion and knows through key of imagination. The deepest power of the human soul is imagination. And when humans bring imagination to the situation, we join the agents of creation. It's always been that way, and it's trying to be that way again. And the other thing in the story that's hinted at is this. Each human being, especially on the moments of awakening, can realize that they are threaded into the weaving of the world. Each person is secretly sewn and threaded to the soul of the world, for the world has a soul. That is to say, the world is a living being. It's breathing, you can see that every time you go to the forest, but also it is creating itself moment to moment, and humans are threaded into that ongoing creation. And so if we have done the damage to cause the creation and the heating up of the planet, we have also the opportunity to reverse that flow and turn it into something else and participate in the weaving of the new beautiful garment. Is it not the case? But some things have to be realized, because notice the knowledge is hidden in the cave, and the cave is a place of interiority. It's inside the earth. It's like earth knowledge, hidden in the darkness inside, just the way knowledge is hidden inside a person's soul. Native American people call it your medicine, that you were born with the medicine you need to awaken to become yourself. And once you do that, you have the medicine that you can share with other people, and then healing is beginning to happen from the depths of the person, knowledge hi hidden in the depths. And notice, what's going on in the cave, there are three major functions, and they are the only three functions in the world. One of them is sustainability, we call it now. When you go back and you stir the cauldron and you take care of the water and the fire and you make a balance so that the seeds can grow, that's called sustaining, but it's only one function of the world. The other one you saw was when the black dog came in and took everything apart. That's called destruction, and that's happening in the world all the time, too, and no one could do anything about it. And the third one is called creation. And together, those three, creation, destruction, and sustaining, are the only three things that the world does. And we, human beings, are part of all three. Now notice the dog is black. That is to say, black lives matter. <laughs> Don't you get it? Blackness matters. Darkness matters. Knowledge like light is hidden in darkness. A culture that deems itself white only has a half view of the world because all light comes from the darkness. Darkness matters. Darkness is a characteristic of the soul and everyone has a soul and everyone inside them has knowledge that they were born with and in that they're intended to share in the world. The Western word for it is genius. The old Greek word is daemon or daimon. In India, they used to call it dharma. The Dharma is the law inside you, the law of your own soul that set you up to go at life in a certain way. The modern world is considered an accidental world. But the old world, the way people used to think about the world, this world had order in it. Order was called cosmos in Greek, the implicate order of the world. But also in the world is chaos, the opposite of order, the collapse of everything. And we are living in the moment of collapse and renewal, in the moment of uncovering and discovering. The word apocalypse comes from the Greek apocalypsis, and it doesn't mean the fiery end of everything. It means lifting the veil. We're in the moment in time when the veil lifts and you see behind, and you see what the politicians are doing, and you see what the business people are doing, and you see what's happening inside the Catholic Church, and you see everything as the veil lifts and it all gets revealed. And in that moment of revelation, a person has a choice. They can back away from the world out of fear or cynicism, or they can step into the moment, find the thread, pick it up, and join the weaving. Does it make some sense? The old Greek, the oldest Greek word for wisdom is translated as dark knowledge. To be wise, a person has to understand both darkness and light. Darkness matters. Matter of fact, the universe is made of mostly dark matter, dark energy, and black holes. Only a small part of it is light. If we don't begin to understand the darkness and realize that life is coming from the darkness into view, then we are looking in the wrong place for the hidden knowledge. 
Ancient stories, there are many of them, uh, talk about how the world renews itself the same way that a forest renews itself. And part of the renewing of the world involves human beings. I know it's popular now to say that maybe nature is finished with her experiment of making humans, and maybe we've used up our time on the world stage. And maybe it doesn't matter if humans are not part of the mix anymore. But the old stories say humans are threaded between the heavens and the depths of the earth, and that you may feel yourself connected horizontally through the world wide web, but what really matters is to be connected through vertical imagination that gives you depth into the darkness of the earth and the depth of your own soul, and that allows a person to touch the light and not get burned or overwhelmed. Am I making sense? So we thought we'd maybe do another story just to continue the idea of this world, the way it's seen mythologically, that can get unraveled, but it cannot end. As a matter of fact, the word end does not mean completion. It means loose end or remnant. There's always a loose thread. There's always a remnant in one's personal life and in the life of the world. And if we look for that thread, it can pull us back towards the center. And if each person was going with their thread back towards the center, we would meet in the weaving that the old woman is just beginning to see. And we can join her in the revisioning and the reweaving of the world. That's the basic idea. So this is the story, we're going to have to do it kind of fast because of timing. The modern world is based on timing. The ancient world was based on being timeless. Anyway, <laughs> mythology is about timelessness, so it's hard to fit it into time, but we're going to try and do it. This is a story from a small tribe along uh, uh, the Amazon River. Uh, each tribe has to have its story of the whole world. That's, humans are the only cosmologists. And this is a little cosmological story from a small tribe in Brazil. Once upon a time, once you could say in a time like this time, it happened that the world got overheated and there was nothing to stop the overheating of the world, global warming on a massive scale with nothing to interrupt it. And so what happened was the earth began to burn and soon everything was being turned into ashes. The forest reduced to nothing but ash. The animals unable to escape the flames burning in all directions reduced to nothing but ash. And eventually, shocking to say it, human beings getting caught in the fire that time were reduced to ash as well. So there was nothing left of the entire planet except ashes in all directions. And everything and everyone was gone except for two beings who happened to be out of the world at the time the world went on fire. They happened to be in the other world. Do you know about the other world? The other world exists right next to this world. It's the world of eternity. It's the world of imagination and ongoing creation. It's the world from which this world comes. This world is only the front of the world, and the other world is the world behind this world. And those two beings, named Ikan Shu and Shuna, happened to be visiting in the other world while this world burned up, and therefore they were not consumed by the fires. They were continuing to live. And they were kind of like human beings, but it was a long time ago when the animals and the humans were really close to each other, so they were also like bird beings. They were like birds and they were like humans. At any rate, they decided to go back home, and they were now flying over the surface of the earth, and they were looking for their home. But no matter where they looked, all they could see was ashes everywhere. And they didn't know where home was, and they were beginning to fall into a kind of sadness and despair, because people are always looking for home. And at that point, the trickster, oh yeah, the trickster survived the fire as well. Don't forget that. It takes good tricks to survive a time of dissolution. The trickster came and said, you know, if while you're flying your index finger forks down, points down to the ground, it will be pointing at your home. 
Now, I don't know how it was they were flying and had index figures. It's an old story. You just have to go along with it. So now the two of them were flying, waiting for their index fingers to point down. And sure enough, at a certain point, their fingers began to point down. There's a lesson in that. Home is down down in the earth, down in the soul, down in the caves of knowledge. And so they began to descend to the ground. And when they descended to the ground, they began to look for food because as soon as you become manifest in the grounded world, you want to eat. They were looking around in the ashes for food but couldn't find any until Ikanchu's foot hit on something hard and he reached down into the ashes and pulled that something out. He looked at it, it was a piece of charcoal. It occurred to him that charcoal, although it had been part of a growing tree at one point, was not something you could eat. But he was holding it in his hand anyway, and he was thinking, you know, trees were also the source of drums. And this piece of charcoal just might be like a drum. And since I can't eat, I might as well begin to play this piece of charcoal like a drum. And so he can't chew. There, in the ashes at the end of the world, began to play the piece of charcoal like a drum. And as long as he was drumming, he thought, I might as well dance. And so E. Kanchu began to dance in the ashes at the end of the world while playing on the drum. And as long as he was drumming and dancing, he thought, I might as well sing. And now E. Kanchu was singing and drumming and dancing in the ashes that were kind of the end of the world. And he was having a pretty good time all in all until he got tired. And then he fell asleep. He laid right down in the ashes, and he fell asleep. It doesn't say how long he was sleeping. He was just sleeping for a while. And in the morning, or whenever the light came back, Ikanchu woke up again, and he looked around. And there were the ashes. And there was that piece of charcoal laying in the ashes. And as Ikanshu looked at that charcoal, he could see a green tendril growing from it. And he quickly realized what had happened. Because he was singing and dancing and playing the charcoal like a drum, he had affected that sound from the beginning and the reverberation and the echo of creation. And it had awakened a deep green imagination inside the black car charcoal. I told you blackness mattered. And now the green life was coming out of the dark charcoal. And Ikanshu knew that what he had to do was dance around that charcoal and sing to that charcoal. And that's what he did. And soon enough, the green tendril began to grow. And it grew straight up, and it grew thicker, and it became a stem. And pretty soon, that stem became a trunk. And pretty soon, that little green tendril that had grown out of the charcoal that had been laying in the ashes of the end of the world, that tendril turned into the tree of life. And Ikanshu was standing there, dancing there, singing there, looking at the tree of life, which is the tree behind all the trees and all the forests, the tree that connects all people through its roots and branches. The very tree of life come back from the ashes of the world. And at that point, while he was dancing and celebrating that, his foot hit something hard in the ashes, and he stopped. And as he stopped, he reached down into the ashes, and he found this time a rock in the ashes. And here he was in the ashes at the end of the world, standing before the tree of life with a rock in his hand. And it occurred to him, what should I do with this rock? What do you do with the rock when you're near the tree of life? He didn't really know, and an instinct or an intuition in him said, well, throw it at the tree. Now, I know this could be disturbing to people who are trying to build an ecological movement. The idea of throwing trees at the tree of life could be a little bit counter wisdom. But you have to understand, it was the end of the world and the ashes were everywhere and tricks of all kind were needed and instincts of all kind were also important. And so, Ikanshu took the rock and he threw it at the tree of life and it hit a branch on that tree and that branch fell from the tree of life into the ashes and for a moment it disappeared into the ashes and the moment after that it began to rise up from the ashes and grow into a tree itself and pretty soon that branch had become a tree and so Ikanshu looked for another rock and threw it at the tree of life. It knocked down another branch. That branch hit the ashes, turned into a tree. He did it again and he did it again until all the species of trees were coming back and growing right from the ashes at the end of the world. 
And then Ikanchu kept dancing. He kept singing. And pretty soon the trees turned into the forest again and the forest began to spread in all directions. And once the forest had grown back, the animals began to appear as well. And pretty soon the birds were flying through the branches and all the animals were soft footing it on the earth. And after a time, the people came back. The human beings came back as well and pretty soon everyone was back in the world the way they used to be all together, the plants and the animals and the people. And they say that's how the earth came back after global warming had turned everything into ashes. And the people that have this story, once a year they get together and they stand before certain fruit trees and they take rocks and they throw rocks at the fruit on the tree. And when the fruit falls to the ground, they pick it up and they give it to each other. And specifically, they give a piece of fruit to anyone they have offended or anyone who has offended them until all the people are coming together again through the fruit of the tree of life, through the fruit of knowledge, through the rhythm and through the dance and through the song because they begin to all sing together in order to carry on the reverberation of creation which is secretly going on inside the body and inside the mind of everyone who's living no matter whether it's the high time or the low time, the bright time or the dark time, even if it's the, if it's the ashes at the end of the world. So that's a story from a little tribe by the Amazon River that did a lot of thinking about what happens when climate change comes, when the world gets too hot, when people forget what it is to have a soul. Because if you want to consider what's going on in the world right now, we're in a battle for the soul of the world. We're in a battle for the soul of human beings living in the world in a way that makes sense with the rest of the world. We have about a minute left, I think. I'm trying to keep an eye on time while I keep my feet in timeless things. And I want to go back to the threads. If you go back far enough in time, everyone is indigenous. I know the Europeans became Eurocentric. Someday we'll forgive them for it. But even the Europeans were once tree people. They were once dedicated to the forest, believe me. And that old knowledge can awaken again. And people can remember things older than history. And people might even remember that history is not something we walk into or fall into. History is made in the depths of the human soul. History is born from the souls of those who are born to a given time. We are the makers of history, not just the receivers of history. And so the Irish have a story. They say when the center falls apart and nothing can hold anymore, the job of a person is to go to the darkest place they see. I told you, darkness matters. And when you get to the darkest place, you can find the thread of your own genius. And if you can find that thread, you can turn around and begin to pull your thread back towards the center. And enough, if enough people find their genius thread and begin to pull it back, then the center will be remade from all those threads. And no one has to be heroic or work too hard. Everybody can participate in the remaking and the reweaving of the center from the threads that are hidden in the darkness, hidden in the darkness of the human soul. And we humans, simple, confused, as we are, can actually contribute to the healing of the soul of the world. Contribute to the healing of the soul of the world. Thank you.